Welcome everybody to my talk. My name is Ulrich Pfeiffer. I'm with the University of Wuppertal in Germany and I'm going to talk about towards terahertz and 6G systems on the chip. I will first start out with a motivation about a brief history of terahertz imaging in silicon technologies and I will give you one example of a terahertz MIMO system on a chip which evolved from a terahertz imaging setup and there you will see that uh, we are currently have a lot of uh, terahertz transmitter and receivers available for many applications and this is also something that's being developed into a 60 terahertz communication system where you have multiple transmitter and receivers available. So I will give you two examples for 60 communication. The first one is about a single channel 100 gigabit per second wireless link and then I will show you one example how one could realize um, polarization diversity MIMO systems with higher data rates. And then I will conclude my presentation. Now let's look into a brief history of terahertz imaging and let's see how terahertz imaging systems have evolved over the recent years. So we first start out with a single transmitter, single receiver focused terahertz imaging system where the transmitter illuminates a single spot on an object, it goes through the object and a single receiver is capturing the, the signal passing through the object. Now this is raster scan, so it takes a long time until you've built up your image, but the signal to noise ratio is very excellent, it's very strong. And these systems have been used for many years, going back to the year 2010, for instance, which has been presented, for instance, at the ICCC conference. From there, things were moving on and uh, we have seen a number of focal plane arrays um, being used on the receiver side. So there we had an, uh, many, many elements, many antenna coupled direct detector arrays with thousands of elements on the receiver side um, that helped up to speed up the imaging acquisition time very rapidly, but the drawback is that a single transmitter still has to be used to provide all the power that goes through the object into the camera. So overall the signal to noise ratio turned out to be rather poor compared to the single element scanner systems that we've seen previously. And now just recently you have seen that also the transmitter side was undergoing some transformation where we were moving from a single transmitter to, to a multi-transmitter array. For instance, here with a number of antenna coupled oscillators that kind of together uh, combine the power of all these elements to illuminate the object. Of course, this has better SNR because you have more transmit power and that of course helps the imaging speed. But now the question is, can we do something more different? And I, I really want to draw your attention into a MIMO system where you have a smart source array that actually does more than just providing the signal power for illumination. And this is one example shown here, where we have a first step to, towards a real MIMO system. On the left side again, you have a transmitter array. Uh, think about it as these antenna covered oscillators, but each of these oscillators can be switched on and off very quickly. So each of them has a different on off chopping frequency indicated here as a different color in this 2D array. So let's say they are, they are uh, eight by eight, which means 64 sources that are available. And now all these signals go through the object at different positions across the object, and then they are meet together, add up their signals on a single receiver. So in a way, this is a single pixel camera, but it has a multiple transmitter array. So it's a multiple input and a single output system. Now this can be used for imaging and uh, this has been demonstrated at the ISSC conference in February this year and uh, there we were actually demonstrating the first uh, 2D image recorded with a single pixel terahertz camera. So it's really uh, quite interesting and very similar to what actually communication systems are undergoing these days. And uh, here I just wanted to show you some of the circuit diagrams that are included in this work. On the left side, you see the block diagram of this source array. And I mainly wanted to point out that this is um, a system on chip where you have not only the RF front end included, which is indicated here by the ring antennas and the oscillators, but you also have all the control signals included, as well as a digital interface, an SPI interface to program various kind of chopping frequencies. You have uh, in-memory programming available 
and then also there's an ADC included to actually measure what kind of transmit power you are providing. So very similar to automatic level controls in communication systems. And on the right side here, you see the chip micrograph, you see the 8x8 um, pixel layout, um, you see the ring antenna as well as the driving oscillator part. If you want, uh, I would like to refer you to this ICC paper if you are interested in finding out more about this, this chip. Now, uh, the measured results are quite interesting to look at it under the perspective of how much power you can actually uh, generate at these high frequencies. So this array was actually operated at 420 gigahertz. And if you see how much power you can get as you increase the number of pixels that are on, you see that you first have an, a linear kind of uh, increase and then you very similar to power amplifiers or communication system, you're kind of hitting a hard compression at some point. And this is mostly due to thermal limitations uh, in the overall heat dissipation that you can actually dissipate by your packaging and module design. So overall, the peak power that we are able to generate here at 420 gigahertz out of a ceiling technology is, is uh, just a bit above 10 dBm. Also, the DC to RF efficiency is shown here at 0.24%, quite low if you compare that, of course, to, lo to lower frequency millimeter wave circuits. And the power consumption here in Watt, you see this is, of course, one of the key things why this module is going to be quite hot when you operate it. Now, in comparison, this is quite interesting to compare these source arrays with the state of the art, where most of the existing source arrays are targeting synchronous locking between the elements, whereas this array um, is really operated independently. So it's kind of a non-coherent operation of the array. And that actually has a benefit for the imaging application that I just presented to you. You really want to keep each of these sources as a separate channel, like in a MIMO communication channel. And uh, then you can actually come up with these um, cool and exciting compressive imaging or um, system design concept for, for new terrace applications. Now, I don't want to go much more into I just want to keep this as a motivation to you that in silicon technologies, you can easily implement thousands of antenna coupled receivers and you can have tens of antenna coupled transmitters as well um, which is very similar to a MIMO system with very high output power and on top of that you can also integrate all the bells and whistles that are required for programming you can include um, digital control logic serial interfaces built-in self-tests very similar to automatic level control in communication systems and now, of course, the question is, um, how can we leverage all this experience for Terrat's MIMO communication systems? There are, of course, a number of ideas how you can increase the data rates further. Uh, one of them, of course, is to increase the bandwidth, the spectral efficiency. And the key thing to further scale this up, of course, is multiple channels running in parallel, like in a MIMO system. And I would like to walk you through two examples where we have actually tried that. The first example is a single wireless link, which is also being discussed uh, on Wednesday in session TS20. And then I will, uh, in, a, in a more exploratory work, uh, show you one example where we actually try to implement a polarization diversity MIMO system, which was um, giving us a data rate which is slightly higher at 110 gigabits per second. Now here you see first the single channel 220 to 260 gigahertz transmit and receive chip set that was also previously published. On the left side you see the transmitter uh, direct up conversion block diagram and on the right side you see the direct down conversion receiver block diagram. We are using multiplier chains for fundamental frequency generation for the double balanced Gilbert cells on both sides. Uh, keep in mind here that we have differential baseband um, IOs for in-phase and quadrature signals. And below you see the chip layouts. Now when you look at the measured RF characteristics of the transmitter on the left side, um, it is important to note how much output power one is able to generate at about 230 gigahertz. You can get up to almost uh, 
9, 9.5 to 10 dBm. Um, the LO frequency can be adjusted over a very large bandwidth from 220 to 260 gigahertz. The um, 3 dB RF bandwidth is 25 gigahertz. And uh, if you compare this with the mix uh, first receiver design on the right side, um, you see that there we have a single sideband noise figure of 13.5 to 14 dB with a 28 to 14 gigahertz 3 dB RF and IF bandwidth. Now, this chip also has been tested in a test bed for data rate, EVM, and maximum range. Uh, here you see the modules that are used uh, for the transmitter on the left and for the receiver on the right side. You also see the quite um, um, expensive test system that is required. Uh, you need very fast AWGs for the transmitter side, for IQ modulation generation, and as well for the digital uh, sampling on a real-time oscilloscope on the receiver side. Um, you see the very specification of the test equipment here in this drawing. And if you look at the measured link performance, you see in this chart the measured EVM over the various data rate points that we have characterized this chipset at. And uh, the maximum data rate that we were able to get here is shown here in this 16 QAM cancellation diagram here on the right side with uh, 25 gigabytes and 100 gigabits per second data rate. Now the question is, how can we improve the data rates further? And uh, this really brings us to the motivation back where we were talking about MIMO systems. And one possible system configuration is shown in the next slide. Now on this slide, you see a polarization diversity MIMO wireless link, where you have the dual transmitter module block diagram on the left side and the dual receiver module block diagram on the right side. You basically get two almost two independent channels one shown here in green where you have an i and a q channel that's been transmitted on a right hand polarized radiation from the antenna into a right hand polarization uh, receiver whereas the red data channel uh, also an iq channel is being transmitted on the opposite polarization which is a left hand circular polarization and with this you can Hopefully, isolate these channels well enough so that you can actually increase the data rate by combining two channels in, in one system. Now, um, that of course uh, should double the data rate uh, if you have no isolation at all. But as we will see, there's of course still some remaining um, isolation in the system, as well as the fact that we have only driven these uh, inputs single ended. Uh, that has created some asymmetry, which is further limiting the uh, achievable data rate. But as a, as a first trial, I would like to show you some of these results of this setup. And in this slide, you see the chip micrographs on top for the transmitter chip. And on the bottom for the receiver chip, you also see how the antenna is actually being built. Um, you see the two slots for two orthogonal orientations of the antenna and then a 90 degree hybrid that is in front of it driving it uh, to create the 90 degree phase shift that's required for the left hand and right hand circular polarization. You also see some of the 3D physical models that are being created here for EM simulations on the top right side. You also see how this uh, antenna has been simulated together with a silicon lens. So the radiation actually goes out of the antenna and goes through the silicon lens. And on the left, uh, on the, sorry, on the right side, on the bottom right side here, you see the module, including a heatsink and the silicon lens from the front side. Now, one of the most important uh, measured performance metrics here is the channel isolation, which needs to be as good as possible to really have separate channels that are just adding in, in terms of their data rate in the end. Now, um, the most impact is here actually given by the antenna actual ratio, which is shown in the left plot. So the solid line here is showing the, the directivity of the antenna, whereas the dashed line is the actual ratio. And the actual ratio, of course, should be as close as possible to one. 
and the directivity um, ideally is limited by the aperture of the silicon lens which is around 24 to 25 dbi over this frequency from 210 to 270 gigahertz now when you look at the isolation versus different orientations between the receiver and the transmitter you see also that this is always staying below 15 db which um, is, is quite good for the link characterization now in in this chart you see the measured mimo link performance um, so we have demonstrated data rates up to 110 gigabits per second which was measured for QPSK modulation. So we have two channels, each operating at 55 gigabits per second over one meter distance at 230 gigahertz. So the top chart, in fact, shows you the measured EVM over various kind of data rates um, for the left hand circular polarized channel. And below you see the EVM measured over various data rates for the right hand circular polarized channel. And you see also two of the constellation diagrams here for on the top 30 gigabits and 55 gigabits per second and on the bottom for C for 30 and as well 50 gigabits per second now if you increase the distance you cannot maintain that kind of data rate and you would have to back off and move to a lower um, sample rate which gives you in fact only two channels which are running at 40 gigabits per second for qpsk modulation now finally, let's compare this performance to other works in this field. Um, here you see a list of different kind of references, including different device technologies, different operating frequencies and uh, modulation formats. Previously, of course, with this similar kind of hardware, we were able to get 100 gigabits per second. And with this dual channel uh, MIMOS system, we were not able really to double the data rate. Uh, and most of this is due to the asymmetry in the IF signaling, um, which causes asymmetries, but still we are able to increase the data further to 110 gigabits per second over one meter. Now, finally, in summary, we have seen that sil silicon process technologies enabled terahertz MIMO systems fully integrated on a single chip, mainly driven by imaging and sensing applications, but Likewise, one can look into MIMO systems as well for communication systems, of course, at the terahertz frequency range. And I've shown you two examples, uh, polarization diversity MIMO communication link, as well as a single channel communication link in comparison. We have seen data rates of 110 gigabits per second and 80 gigabits per second over one and two meters respectively. And you have also seen how these modules are packaged in a rather inexpensive chip on board technology, including silicon lenses. Now, future work, of course, includes to understand the link impairments. In particular, uh, we have to move on to a differential baseband drive again to improve the um, asymmetries again and therefore increase the data rate to the ideal scenario that you can actually double the data rates when you increase the number of channels. We also have to solve the digital baseband gap which relates to the available arbitrary waveform generator and real-time oscilloscopes. Of course those uh, chips need to also be integrated into the R front end to come up with a fully integrated um, communication chipset, including the digital baseband. And also in the future, we are looking into beam forming, beam steering capabilities to, to steer these quite directive antenna patterns between the transmit and the receive path. So this concludes my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention. Please also, uh, I would like to acknowledge the collaboration between the PhD students who contributed to this work as well as the funding organizations and I would like to present you the reference list in case you would like to look up any of the presented material. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.